I was going through the list of submissions at the submit a case feature over at lordandarts.com and I saw one posted by someone named Brittany Collins. And here's the message that came with it. Richie Collins is a veteran, served 23 years in the military and worked for U.S. Customs and Border Patrol for nine years. His car was found abandoned with key on top at Colonial Creek Campground at Diablo Lake in the North Cascade Mountains. He's missing from Bellingham, Washington. Please help me. I really need help. Brittany's father obviously served this country in more than one way. And I think it's time to see if we can serve him and help his daughter find out what happened to him. It's time to turn on the searchlight for Richie Collins. Welcome to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me and thank you for caring about these cases like I do and helping people like Brittany who are looking for answers. And Brittany has been working very hard. I can see she's all over social media answering as many questions as she can. There has been a podcast released on this case by my good friend Marissa over at Vanished. I'm going to try to weave in some of that information as we're going through all this on top of the latest developments directly from Brittany's posts. Um, and we'll see if we can get some kind of understanding about what's going on here. But obviously a vehicle being found, campground parking lot, key for the vehicle on top. We've got some very strange considerations going right off the top of this case. But let's start by learning a little bit about where this is going on. Richie was living in Bellingham. So Bellingham, Washington uh, is the most populous city in and the county seat of Whatcom County in the U.S. state of Washington. It lies 21 miles south of the U.S.-Canada border. Uh, obviously, I just wanted to point that out because he had also worked um, with Border Patrol services as well. The city had a population of 80,885 as of the 2010 census, but they're noting that it has grown. They're estimating that it's over 90,000, well over 90,000 as of 2019. So um, we're, we're definitely talking about a pretty well populated area. You can see in the aerial view here, a uh, lot of businesses, a lot of homes, a lot going on around that port. But let's uh, go ahead and continue with some more information coming directly from Brittany. Uh, and this is just, there's, there's kind of a heartbreaking aspect to this story in terms of Brittany and her father were not exactly close. You know, he's living a military career life. Uh, he's being deployed constantly, but they seem to make some connections. Um, however, not that strong that she would necessarily notice if he went missing and then you have him go missing. You literally have articles being written about him being missing, but she doesn't know about it yet. So this is a post where she's kind of tells a story about how she came to, to learn about this. My fiance and I had recently bought a truck and everything we needed to go camping. We decided our first trip would be Colonial Creek Campground at Diablo Lake in the North Cascades. Now, they tried to go there. The campground was full, but they were directed to a different one. They said they had an amazing weekend. But one week later, back home in Seattle, I met up with my mom for lunch. My aunt in Arkansas just got in contact with her and said my biological father was reported missing April 30th, 2019. That's four months earlier than Brittany's camping trip. When his car was found abandoned with the key on top, out of all places, Colonial Creek Campground. My aunt passed away in December 2019. She was my rock through this nightmare. She died while trying to find what happened to her brother and helping me with everything. Richie Collins is still missing. Um, of course, the Vanish podcast, you know, a lot of it is interview based. Her aunt is a significant amount of the interviews that are in that episode as well. Um, and of course, Brittany herself is in there. Uh, let me just get right off the top of this. If you are interested in this case, if you live close to this area, if you're looking for further detail, your next stop right after this video should be the Vanished podcast. 
Um, we do very different types of coverage. I'm a little bit more nuts and bolts. Marissa, uh, a little more from the heart and social information. So um, I'm sure you're going to get a very complete view of this case if you look at both of us as a resource. But let's start with the basics of this case over at NamUs. I'm thankful that there's already a case created here for Richie Ambrose Collins, a white male Caucasian. Date of last contact here, they have it listed as April 23rd, 2019. And that's one of the strange things about this case is that we're not really sure when he was last seen. Uh, the family has some feelings about it could be as early as in March that he actually went missing. Um, we're we're going to try to piece some of that together as we're going through the details here today. But 58 years old at the time that he went missing. Currently, he would be 60 years old, stands between six feet and six feet two. I've heard other sources say that he's six one, uh, weighs between 250 to 280 pounds. This is, uh, this is a big guy. This is a big guy with military training. I want you to keep that in mind as we're going through all this. And this is a guy that also liked collecting weapons and had a lot of guns, had past tense, Another very strange aspect of this case, but let's continue here. Um, all right, so circumstances of disappearance. Richie Collins was last seen as at his residence on or around April 23rd, 2019 by a neighbor. I, I just, let me put it out there right now. The neighbor's information, I'm not sure how reliable it is. There's a lot of questions raised in the Vanish podcast about the neighbor's information. The neighbor seems to recall him being in his uniform for working at the border patrol, but he hadn't had that job for several years. So I, I'm not, I, I don't know how much stock we could put in the neighbor's information. We've got some other strong indicators of trying to figure out when he was still you know, running his own finances and things like that, that I think we need to lean on a, a little bit more than the neighbor's information. His vehicle was located on April 30th, 2019 at the Colonial Creek Campground in New Hallam, Washington. The keys to the vehicle were found on the hood of the vehicle. Uh, and I just want to clarify that a little bit. Key. I, I've seen a picture. The picture is literally one key. Nothing else, not a key ring, not his house key. It's literally just the key to the vehicle. And I'll show you that picture and tell you about another consideration I have with that a little bit later. Extensive searches have been conducted in the wooded area around the campground. Nothing of evidentiary value was found. Richie has been known to keep to himself and does not have an extensive friend base. Very tricky aspect to this case. If you've got someone that's a little bit of a homebody or someone that doesn't have a giant social circle, and they go missing, first of all, just trying to figure out when they go missing, that becomes tough. Um, if they're not working at the time, they don't have kind of a daily routine or expectations of them being at a specific place at a specific time. Once again, trying to put the time frame around when they actually go missing, very, very tough. But then consider the investigation angle. Who do you reach out to here? Uh, he's got family. His family lives in other parts of the country. Um, it just, it really narrows the scope of the investigation. And I can see why this is such a tough one. And I can see why Brittany is asking for, for help from every place that she can find it. Richie is prior military and a search of his residence revealed several articles of survival type gear and food. Now they did talk about this on the Vanish podcast. It seems like some of his family wasn't really aware of this aspect of his personality where, where other members were like, yeah, no, that was, that was pretty normal. Um, I, I don't want to say, I don't, I don't think he's like a doomsday prepper level, but he's certainly, I think they word it right here. Survivalist, you know, we're talking, um, food reserves that are ready in the place, water reserves that are ready in the place. Of course, uh, ammunition, weapons, things of that level. Did he have an underground bunker built somewhere and all fleshed out ready for the you know nuclear apocalypse or something along those lines? I don't think so. I don't think he's at quite that level. But certainly a man concerned with national security as well. We're going to get into some more of those details as we roll forward. Brown hair, very short, receding hairline. Uh, it's noting here brown eyes as well. Nothing else really for distinctive physical features. We don't have a clothing and accessory description because we don't really have a person that's like the, oh, I was the last person. I know what he was wearing. Here's where he was going. We just have that neighbor. And by the time 
uh, investigators had spoken to the neighbor. The neighbor was like, oh, it was like four days ago when I saw him. Things are very, very loose on the information from the neighbor, from what I gather, based primarily on the Vanish podcast, but also comments that I'm seeing Brittany make in other places. In terms of news coverage, we don't have a whole lot with this case, and that's why I'm really going to weave on some of kind of the nuts and bolts that I heard in the Vanish podcast and try to present this to you guys all in one piece. But we do have a few. Uh, the first one here over at KBU, KPUG1170.com. 58-year-old Richie Ambrose Collins was listed missing on April 30th when park rangers told deputies his vehicle was still parked at the Colonial Creek campground after two weeks. Deputies searched miles of surrounding trail in the North Cascades National Park with no success. Some of the description that I'm hearing about things that were going on with his vehicle, like there's bird nests that are being built around it. Uh, there's a significant layer of dust on it. Even the point of trying to say that it's two weeks might be hard to really estimate. I don't know, and I haven't found any description of this. And Brittany, maybe you have a better answer to this than I do. Occasionally, when monitoring parking lots, they'll have some type of simple system to mark the vehicles that are there. They'll have like a stick with a piece of chalk on the end of it, and they'll tag the tire so they can tell. You know, if they go back a week later, they'll use a different color. They'll tag all those tires. So they'll, they'll kind of have like a rough estimate. I don't know if they're doing something to that level of complexity here. But even with the basics of what we've heard from the NamUs profile to this first story, something's wrong because the neighbor probably didn't see him at home uh, when we've got his vehicle found at the campground on April 30th. And they're saying that it's been there for two weeks. We can't have the neighbor say, well, that's weird because I saw him one week ago on April 23rd. That just, it's, it's not making sense. So once again, that's why I don't know how much we should lean on the neighbor's information. I mean, admittedly, someone else could have taken his vehicle there. It would be great to know that. And something else that's kicked around a lot in the Vanish podcast, which is something I don't put a whole lot of stock into personally. Um, it just, I've never seen this really proved to be a fruitful avenue in, in terms of being a fact that really helps a case. But it's reported that the driver's seat was pulled very close to the steering wheel. Um, I, I know that type of information works really well in crime fiction. I personally have never seen it lead to anything in terms of true crime that's been significant, like a very significant development. It comes up a lot. I know people talk about it a lot. Um, but I just, I haven't seen that turn into an actual kind of aha or gotcha of any kind. And admittedly, I'm not looking at every case that's out there. I'm looking at kind of tougher cases. Um, I, I kind of feel like I would have bumped into that somewhere. I haven't hit it yet. Maybe you guys know of a case where that has been some kind of big gotcha aha moment. Uh, if you do, please tell me about it in the comments down below. Maybe we should do an episode of case cracked on that, but, um, regardless reported, on the Vanish podcast, seat pulled very close to the steering wheel. Where's this all going on? Let's take a look at, here is the Colonial Creek campground and parking area right next to the boat launch. And if we pull out, we can kind of get a sense of where he lived, which honestly, not incredibly far from there. Um, you know, it's a, about a two hour drive, about 90 miles. If we pull out even more, you can see this is all very close to the US Canada border as well. But of course it is. This is someone that worked there um, as, as part of his job. So, um, but the campground kind of interesting that it's there. There is also some talk about, could someone possibly go to this campground and then hike across the border? And apparently it is in theory possible. Um, I don't know if that's what we have going on here. Some of the information around him is he's got a bad knee. He's got high blood pressure, probably not the type of person that's really going to do something like that. And the guy's, you know, coming up on, on 60 years of age as well. So um, is it practical? I don't know. Believe it or not, we haven't even gotten to one of the stranger conditions about this case yet. Um, but let's head over to BellinghamHerald.com. This is three months after he went missing. Uh, his vehicle had been parked at the Colonial Creek Campground in the North Cascades National Park for approximately two weeks. It's not that unusual for people to leave their vehicles in this location for a week, 
two, or even three as they hike into the wilderness, even at the time of the year the car was left in April. And that's according to Kevin Hester, uh, a chief deputy with the county. But at this point, he also states, and this is, of course, huge cause of concern, we've kind of exhausted all of our leads and we're not turning up anything on this location, he said. It took the two and a half months to cover and investigate things. From what I understand, there was two major searches that were done, one from local authorities. I believe that's a four mile radius. And then the state level, uh, like park rangers, they stretched it out to a seven mile radius. It seems like nothing substantial was found in either of those. Uh, there is of course Diablo Lake, which is nearby. You can see it on the map. I mean, the parking area is essentially run right up against one part of the lake. Uh, I believe that they've searched this lake more than once at this point. Uh, we're also not finding anything there. Uh, Hester said that investigation included searching Collins' financial accounts, veterans' records, and work history, as well as interviewing his family back east. The family told the sheriff's office that it was a bit unusual for Collins to go camping, and he wasn't known to take extended backpacking trips. Uh, of course, there's another aspect to consider with all this. Is this someone that for some reason uh, is deciding to end his own life? Is that an area where he is going to leave it all behind? Um, wait until you get to the end of the video before you put too much consideration in that direction. Because I think there's a few things that are really, for me, they're standing out very, very strongly and, make me, and, and making me question that. Uh, let's do just a quick touch on his social presence just to see what we can learn about him. Richie Collins, bachelor's degree at American Military University. Uh, we can see one of his jobs here, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, decorated U.S. Customs and Border Protection officer with nine years of service at a northern land border point of entry. Decorated U.S. Army veteran. Highly motivated to leverage experience gained during U.S. Army and U.S. CPB careers to provide dedicated service as a security professional. So still going along the same um, path for work. I mean, it, it seems like this is someone that really enjoyed that type of career path. Um, and as a matter of fact, in the Vanish podcast, his sister talks about the fact that he did a bunch of additional training and was learning more. Um, kind of more into not cybersecurity, like everyday cybersecurity, but at more of a national security level. Uh, and you can see even in some of the classes that he was taken uh, and what was going on with his degrees here, uh, law enforcement leadership program, um, associate of science. And it looks like he did that work in 2014, 2015, bachelor's degree, emergency and disaster management. Um very clear path for his career and him taking education very seriously after coming out of that job with the Border Patrol as well. In terms of other social information, not a whole lot that I saw at his Facebook profile. Some favorite TV shows, uh, Man in the High Castle, Firefly, Battlestar Galactica, Game of Thrones 20, 24, a show called Strike Back, um, favorite books, The Grapes of Wrath. Looks like he's a fan of George Orwell. Um, but uh, nothing else that I could really glean from this, at least the way his profile is right now, it really just looks like it's commemorating uh, Veterans Day and, and some things around that. And then, of course, we get to the Vanish podcast. So I've made a list of facts and a kind of little timeline that I wanted to touch on with you guys. I'll leave these pictures up as we go through that. We've got photos of him in the military. Uh, we've also got some photos from his home that you'll see on, on this bottom row here. And we'll get into those a little more after we get through these facts here. But uh, what did I learn through the Vanish podcast? Um, he was obviously in the army. I'm hearing reference to him also being a part of Delta Force at some time, retired in the year 2000, got into border security. Uh, he was married once in the late 80s, only lasted about three years. That's when they had a child named Brittany. Got out of Border Patrol around 2013, studied digital forensics related to national security. In terms of tracking him, last Facebook message happened around the end of March. Uh, his sister, Bonnie, who lived out of state, called his number 
on April 4th. And remember, he goes missing uh, in 2019. So we're, you know, a year and a half past at this point. Someone else answered his phone. Uh, they basically said, I don't know who you're trying to reach. I've only had this phone number for a couple days. So it sounded like the phone number got reassigned. She called others who knew him. They also hadn't heard from him in a while. Um, their brother tries to file a missing persons report. The police go and do a welfare check. They talk to the neighbor and the neighbor says, yeah, I heard, I saw him uh, five days ago. He's fine. So they don't open a missing persons report. Sister then tries again to open a separate missing persons report. Again, they do a welfare check, go talk to that same neighbor. Uh, I believe he lives in a townhome and I think the wall is shared between his townhome and, and this neighbor's. Uh, the neighbor says, nope, saw him four days ago. He's fine. So once again, the missing persons report kind of gets stopped. Then on April 30th, we have the car that's found at the campground parking lot with the key on the roof, sitting there weeks, possibly longer. Uh, receipt for gas purchase from February, I think it's February 11th, is found in the vehicle. Also in the vehicle in the glove compartment is a set of disposable rubber gloves. And on those gloves is a box cutter. It's a very kind of strange sight. We'll have a picture of it we're going to look at. Uh, and a map of the Cascade Mountains is found on the passenger seat. If we do think about him going out there and for one reason or another wanting to go off into the mountains, the map is left on the passenger seat. That is very, very strange to me. That's even strange to me thinking about the possibility that he was going out there to end his own life. It still doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why are you going to leave the map behind? I mean, if you... If you're really trying to find some place where you're never going to be found or something like that, you, you know, take the map with you, take a certain trail, a certain direction, and then go off that trail and be sure that you know which way you're going off that trail. If you don't know that area and you try to go off trail, you could all of a sudden wind up very close to an, another trail or something like the risk. And especially thinking from a military perspective, someone that is is trained in thinking about things of this matter, it doesn't seem right to me that that map gets left behind. And then if you take it outside of that consideration, especially if this is supposedly him going on a hike of some kind or some kind of camping trip, it makes absolutely no sense that the map gets left behind. The thing that bothers me about the map is if I want to stage something, if I want it to look like he went out there and he was interested in those hills for some reason, what am I going to do? I'm going to leave a copy of that map on the seat like that. So just the way that that's found calls out to me. I don't know if that was naturally placed there, or I don't know if it's placed there with the intent to throw people off. Also keep in mind, we mentioned he had a bad knee, probably wouldn't go off into the wilderness, uh, high blood pressure on top of that. Back at his house, the biggest thing we haven't touched on yet is his guns are missing. This is a man that collected guns. And as you can see in these photos, like this one down here, we've got huge gun cases, Pelican gun cases. Some of these cases can hold up to uh, six pistols. He's got two cases, I think, that, that hold six pistols each. But rifle cases, all kinds of stuff. All these cases are empty. His family says he was known to have 30 or more weapons. His daughter estimates it somewhere around 35 weapons, about 15 pistols and 20 rifles. Now, we've got some challenges in terms of those weapons because the rifles are seemingly made from parts. I don't know if it was kind of a hobby of his to kind of collect up different parts and put rifles together. Uh, so obviously, there's no registration that's going on with those weapons necessarily. The pistols should be registered. I don't know if the records for that um, are still available. His personal records are at the home. As a matter of fact, in this picture down here, just beyond where the cases are set up on these stools, most of his personal records are laid out on the table in a really, it's strange because it looks almost meticulous, like, like very regimented way. Um, could that have been someone going through his personal records to find all the information about the weapons to make sure that they weren't available somewhere for investigators? I don't know. Uh, it would be very tough for me to believe that someone like this wouldn't keep track of every single weapon and and almost like have a log of that somewhere. So I, I don't know. Challenges when it comes to tracking the weapons. A few of these weapons are also family heirlooms. Very expensive. These weapons, there's, there's probably a considerable amount of money in that. Uh, also, it seems like 
there is some ammunition that's left in the home, but not nearly as much as his family says was there before. In a very, very strange twist, I don't. I, I believe it's the family that notices. There seems to be women's toiletries in the bathroom. Uh, so real quick, let's jump to some of these photos because I, I want to get through some of this with you together. This is kind of a modern picture of him. Looks like it might be a driver's license photo. Uh, here we have him deployed, obviously. Uh, younger photo of him here. So, I mean, just look at this room. Look at how it's laid out. I don't know if these are parts or if these are uh, different types of ammo, but just once again, looks like we've got some good organization going on here. Um, little workbench back here that he might use for cleaning or assembling. Uh, more cases in his kitchen area. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Oh, I think this is to show the bleach bottle. Um, obviously we've got a rice cooker here, but there's been some talk that I saw about the possibility that the counter might have been cleaned with bleach. And I think that's what this photo is about to show you that there is a bleach bottle that's out on the counter. Um, some of his water rations, uh, looks like that's being stored under a bed in crates. You just slide the crates out and he's got two liters of water. Uh, another interesting thing that's brought up about his dishes in the dishwasher here is there's a crock pot, but this is the bottom part of the crock pot. This is something that actually shouldn't go in the dishwasher. It's, it's electric. Uh, and you can see we've got the electrical cord for it right here. Um, don't know if that really suits his personality with, uh, with him being in the military or if there's something else going on with this. Was there... If there, if this is a situation where something happened in the house and it was cleaned up, if there was some type of cleaning effort, like we think might have happened with the bleach that's out on the counter, was there some something on this crock pot that people were worried about and they just threw it in the dishwasher and ran it to get rid of it? I don't know. Another interesting thing that we haven't touched on yet, his safe. This is his safe. It was found open by the time investigators got there. Uh, it looks like there should be some weapons in this safe. All the guns are missing. Uh, and for someone that is storing up food and water like he is, I would have also highly suspected that I don't think, I don't know if he would have stored cash necessarily, maybe some amount of cash, but I've, I've known a few guys like this. Uh, if, if they are thinking that, you know, there's some type of big catastrophe that's going to happen, they're going to have like gold and silver stored somewhere. And usually in something like this, um, on top of that, something else that's weird about this, it looks fairly clear that someone tried to pry them their way into this safe. And, uh, Brittany says that the investigators are telling her, well, we think that he actually did that. I don't think he did that because anyone that has opened this safe at any point and has seen how the mechanism works knows that getting some stupid little crowbar in this far is not going to do anything for rolling these pins back. It's just, it, it's not helpful at all. Someone that hasn't been in the safe and doesn't understand the locking mechanism might go about opening it this type of way. So I have a feeling and some of these marks, they look kind of fresh. Like there's a lot of debris and stuff that's still on the top here. I'm sure it's paint that was scraped from whatever tool they were using. You can see, I mean, this, whatever tool they were using, it really scraped this thing up pretty decently. And as a matter of fact, some of the, the size of the tool, I mean, it looks like a screwdriver in some places. I mean, just it's, you're not going to get this thing open doing that. Um, I really believe that all this damage is from someone that didn't understand this safe very well. And I, I don't think it's from him. I don't think someone that has opened the safe once and saw how this locking mechanism works would think that they could ever have a chance of prying it open like that. Then how did they get it open? Once again, we've got all his personal items that have been laid out on the counter. Did he possibly have the combination written, saved in his personal records? It's weird because if you have a safe like that, you'd think his personal records, like, you know, passport, old credit cards and stuff like that would actually be in the safe. Uh, so maybe there was somewhere else where um, he had the, the, the safe code written or if perhaps it was forced out of him. We, we don't know, but we've got over 30 weapons that are supposedly missing here. You can see uh, the foam cutout for one of the cases. Obviously the, the weapon is missing. 
Uh, here is the box cutter and the gloves that were found in the glove compartment. Shot of where it was found. Another shot of when he was younger. A few more shots of when he was younger. Uh, the key. I wanted to point out to you. So this is from uh, Washington's most wanted coverage of the case. Uh, a few things about the key. First of all, a little bit of rust on it. I don't know if that's from it actually sitting out there for a few weeks. But first, primarily, obviously, it's not a keychain that has his house key, his garage key, some work keys, some lock keys. All that we have here is literally the key for the vehicle. But I've had a keychain that had something like this on it before. See how there's this bead and it has a little hole in the bead. That's a quick release key ring. Uh, the other side is like this kind of piston that fits into that hole and it grips it to the rest of your keychain. So like if you had a car key that you were frequently letting your wife borrow or something like that, you might put it on a system like that so you could pop it off the rest of your keys your wife could take your vehicle and go somewhere, but you would still have your house key, your garage key, and all that other stuff. Um, that bead, in my mind, is I'm almost certain it's a system like that. So this is not his complete set of keys. This is just a driver's key, but it's been removed from the rest of this keychain. I don't know why, um, but it's sitting on top of his car and supposedly for a matter of weeks before it's found. There are some more photos here. This is over at the Facebook page for Richie Collins Missing. And here you can see, look at his personal records here. I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's like meticulous. I mean, we've got rows of the cards. We've got all kinds of personal information. We've got his passport. Uh, there's even photos that are being laid out here. Once again, is this someone that's looking for information? Are they picking through this and taking things while they're taking off with the weapons? Uh, is this made to look like this is someone that's trying to get their affairs in order before they leave this life? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I really don't know what to make of this too much. The biggest problem I have is with that many weapons missing and the cases being left behind, that logic doesn't hold up very well for me. Uh, and I do believe that investigators found traces of him selling weapons back in 2016, um, but not a lot, like he, you know, sold a couple off. Um, if you're selling weapons or even if you're giving them away or something, why wouldn't you just include the case? Why wouldn't you just send that all as one thing? Leaving the cases behind for me seems to me like a grab. It seems to me like someone that was concerned, they only had so much room that they were dealing with, they only had so much time that they were dealing with, and they were trying to get everything out that they could and not make it as bulky as possible. I mean, you saw those cases. Think of how quickly that could have filled up a vehicle, even, even the uh, Honda Element that he was driving. But if you take those, those guns out of all those cases, you could probably fit 30 guns, I think, in that Honda Element as well. And I'm, I don't even know that that's the vehicle. I'm just saying that's one of the considerations that I'm having with this. A uh, shot of clothes that are in the uh, dryer for the laundry. Um, I don't know. I don't know enough about his personality to know if there's anything really odd about this, but I'm noticing we've kind of got sheets with towels, seemingly with clothes. It's all just kind of jumbled together. I, I don't know what kind of guy he is, if that's really odd or not. This is an interesting shot of a floor, and I don't know what's going on with the markings around it. Um, I don't know what this blue liquid is. Kind of strange. We've already gone through that photo. Oh, one other point about this photo. Look how many items are used here uh, in terms of utensils. I mean, this thing is just full. And I'm really trying to get to the photo of the bathroom because I want to show you guys something that's, yeah, here we go. So the family noted it seemed like there was um, a woman's toiletries in the bathroom. But even just looking at this picture here, uh, the first thing that strikes me is how many toothbrushes do we have going on here? We've got an electric toothbrush. We got two manual toothbrushes. This is supposedly a guy that was living alone. Um, I don't know. And we've got a lot of razors also. I don't know. 
but the the toothbrushes is kind of interesting to me. I mean, do I have more than two, one toothbrush in my bathroom? Yes. Up on the counter? No. No, there's one that's on the counter. I got one that's in the drawer. I got one that's in the cabinet next to the drawer. I, but this is like, uh, I don't know. It just, it seems like there's more than one, possibly more than two people that are even living here. And according to some more of the information we're going to get, that might be what's going on. So let's continue with the notes that I took from the Vanished podcast. His family finds that there is mail that's coming to his house that is not addressed to him. Mail is coming to a woman's name, and they're also noting two men's names. The woman is found to be a former co-worker from when he worked back at the Border Patrol. The two men's names turn out to be her sons, and reportedly their children. I don't know what children receive mail. I didn't really receive mail um, I don't know if I ever received mail before I was out on my own. I mean, I would assume maybe my parents had received something in my name, but I, I can't imagine what it would have been. But regardless, uh, it seems like for some reason, a woman was having her mail delivered there. We're talking about, uh, you know, it seems like there's some feminine items that are being found in the house, uh, and possibly was there children living there as well? Maybe. In his car was a letter supposedly from him allowing this same woman to take his car to Canada. I don't know if any analysis has been done on that letter to verify that it's actually in his writing or anything like that. Uh, the first week of March, he made a payment to USAA homeowners insurance. It seems like that was a manual payment. So that's one of the kind of things they're leaning on in terms of we know that this is something that he did. One of the last things that we can identify that he actually did. Uh, Detective Gates, the current lead investigator on this, was interviewed on Vanished as well. He just noted some things. Uh, they saw that the appliances were off in the home. The drapes had been closed. He kind of got the feeling that the home was left in a way where the person wasn't expecting to be home for a prolonged period of time. He says there's nothing really suspicious except for the firearms missing. It's kind of strange to me he didn't note the safe being open as suspicious or all the personal identification being laid out on the counter like that suspicious um, or the dig marks in the exterior of the safe being suspicious. Apparently he's, I think detective Gates has told Brittany, he thinks that, um, you know, that it's her father that was trying to get into the safe. I just, I still don't understand that. Uh, they did try looking into history of pawning weapons in that area, trying to find if anyone's trying to sell those weapons. Uh, like I mentioned, they did note that he had pawned a few of his guns in 2016, but that he had many, many more. Uh, Detective Gates says no signs of forced entry, no signs of struggle. Door was locked when they got there. And once again, according to the family, he's a loner. Now, he did have several cell phones and computers. Those were originally supposed to be analyzed. And then I guess the investigators decided not to. Brittany thinks they should still be analyzed. Uh, no real information about his personal cell phone. That's really missing in all the coverage. And, and I can't find anything about it. Uh, any type of tracking of his GPS, any type of contact that he might have had with other people, anything along those lines with his personal cell phone, I can't find. But remember, he was taking these classes about this kind of cybersecurity national uh, forensics aspect. So he had extra cell phones. He had not just one computer. He had several computers. He had things, I think, that were part of his class as well. Um, so there's a lot of elect electronic materials to be analyzed here. Brittany, also in a recent, more recent comment, um, says on Facebook that her father had made six figures, lived modestly, drove a 20-year-old car, but they can't find his money. And that, uh, once again, just leads me to this thought of, is this someone that would take his money and convert it into something else? Did he have a bag of diamonds? but Or did he have you know gold coins and silver coins? Something that would convert if there was some type of uh, economic breakdown. Something that would still be worth something to other people. Um, I don't know, but if he did, I know he wouldn't keep them in a shoebox in his closet. I'm pretty sure he would keep them in that safe. And obviously we have the safe open. Uh, so that's all the notes that I have. Let's get back to another article. This one posted July 17th. 
uh, this year. It's been more than a year since Richie Collins' vehicle was found with the key sitting on the roof. There have been many searches for him that have come up empty, including one last month at Diablo Lake, just below the campground. It's not just Collins that detectives are hoping to find. We found out that family said that Mr. Collins had a lot of firearms in his possession. He was in the Army. He worked for Customs and Border Patrol, and his firearms were nowhere to be found. And his safe was open as well. And no firearms are found inside the safe. We searched the residence. We searched crawl spaces and didn't find firearms. We just don't know where the guns are at this time and what would happen with that many guns. This... I look into a lot of cases where, you know, I'm already bothered by the fact that the they can't look at it with a foul with an eye towards foul play because the person isn't using their accounts, uh, the person ha- didn't take their credit cards, or they verified that you know no, there's no activity on those cards. It already gets me just when you have someone that is supposedly out there somewhere living, but there's no signs of them using anything that they would normally need to be able to take care of themselves. Here, we've got a very different condition and all these firearms missing and the excuse that, you know, maybe he sold them off. Maybe he sold them off between 2016 and 2019 doesn't really hold up when you've got all these aspects of the firearms that are left behind. I mean, admittedly, yeah, maybe he was he could have sold the gun separately and then he was going to sell the cases separately. I mean, yes, I, I get that there is a possibility about that. I, I don't know that it really makes sense here. And for every single there according to the reports we're seeing there are no guns in this guy's house none does that really make sense for someone with this type of career that he would get rid of every single gun that he had i don't know i don't think so and if he did like if there was some kind of big emotional thing where all of a sudden he just regretted that he was ever into this type of stuff uh, is he going to get rid of the guns, but he's going to keep the cases around and he's going to keep some ammo around. And it just, there is a very, very big problem with this case and the guns missing points towards something a lot different than we typically see here on the channel. Detectives want to make it clear that none of the circumstances surrounding Collins's disappearance are a crime at this point. Totally fair. Y- yeah. I mean, maybe, we, the 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 guns missing could be a crime. Um, it's not enough to say that it is a crime because we don't have him to say yes, I had the guns and now they're missing and they were obviously stolen. I mean that's that's what it would take to okay for sure we know that there's a crime, suspicion of a crime in this case in particular one of the highest that I've seen uh, on a searchlight case. Typically we don't get something this strong pointing towards there's some level of foul play that's gone that's gone on around this. Uh, An adult like Collins can leave and start a new life somewhere. They just want to know that both he and his firearms are safe. Of course, we we know that he could have left of his own accord, but leaving behind things that he would need to take care of himself. Admittedly, if he did convert all of his savings and had, you know, a bunch of gold and silver in his safe, could he have cleaned all that and taken that with him? And that's what he's living off of. Maybe, maybe he did jump the border, go somewhere else. Certainly possible. Um, the scene that we're seeing around his house raises a lot of questions. The guns missing in that way raises a lot of questions. I think investigators would have found traces of, um, especially, you know, with the news coverage that's been out around this case. Oh, look, I remember that guy. I bought a rifle from him. And I know this other guy, a friend of mine that was going to talk to him about buying some pistols. Like, I think they would have found the chain of you know, hey, there's a few people that we saw. It looked like he was kind of offloading his weapons over the past few months. And wouldn't he do that if he was going to up and leave? If he was literally going to try to leave with just a bag on his back, he's obviously not going to take 30 guns with him. So wouldn't you try to liquidate the stuff that actually had some monetary meaning like that um, before you disappear off into the wilderness to get to Canada, if that's really what's going to happen? Uh, Which... How hard is it to get into Canada? I just, I don't understand. I don't understand. So uh, several different links for you to continue looking into this for yourself. Um, There is a post at the Vanish Podcast Facebook page. And I just want to point this out because Brittany has really been working a lot of the questions on this post. There's a lot of additional information that you'll find by looking through this specific post. So I'll have that in the uh, sources down below. 
And of course, the Richie Collins missing Facebook page. Uh, you can come here to get more information. Please follow the page. I don't know if they're talking about doing any type of vigils or um, for fundraisers. We've got a little something we're going to touch on by the end of this episode, but please follow missing Richie Collins. Over at Web Sleuths, a little bit of an update from August 17th, 2020, posted by Brittany. Today, I received an email from the lead detective on my dad's case. Nothing big, but I wanted to share this info. I've searched the pawn shop database for your dad's firearms, i.e. large quantity pawn of firearms. This was negative. This is proving to be difficult in tracking the guns because we do not know specific brands, make, models, or calibers. Once again, I can't believe he wouldn't have had some form of, of keeping record of all that. And it could be those records are in the computers. It could be that the family, the computers, I think, have been returned to the family. Uh, they might have that information on one of those hard drives and not even know it. I'm pretty sure I just I, I really have a feeling he would have tracked that kind of stuff. I've talked to our search and rescue deputy and asked him if another search of the wilderness area around Colonial Creek can be conducted. With the two previous searches being ex as extensive as they were, he advised that another search would not be beneficial unless evidence was found to suggest that your dad was in the area or a specific location. That's another big question in this case. Um, you know, based off the stuff I was hearing on the Vanish podcast, I'm pretty sure the family has a strong feeling that he was never part of the trip of the Honda element going to that location. Uh, so I don't think, I, I think it's very strong that they don't expect to find him out there. And now we're actually hearing from the search and rescue deputy himself. Hey, unless we get something that says this guy was actually out here, it doesn't make sense for us to keep doing this. And we know there's been several searches over the past year. They're not finding any trace of him. He also asked about my dad's phones and said he could possibly get them analyzed without the passcodes. I told him who has his phone, so hopefully we can get that done. He also said he will do better to keep con to keep in contact and update me, which I really appreciate and gives me some hope. At some point, something big has to crack in my dad's case. I certainly hope that happens sooner rather than later to Brittany. Um, there is a GoFundMe that has been opened. It was opened, I think, yeah, back in April of this year. Of course, you know, the world went sideways after that. And you can see that this GoFundMe didn't get the attention that it probably should have. $350 raised of $2,000. Essentially, she's trying to raise enough money to pay a private investigator to analyze the computers and the cell phones. Uh, which 2000 bucks I think is super reasonable for that. And it looks like there's a person actually assigned to it here, uh, solved it investigations, it looks like, has agreed to do it for that amount. Um, but I know just with the work that Brittany's doing, just with you know traveling, um, putting up posters, doing t-shirts, Facebook posts that you want to boost, whatever, I I'm sure that... Brittany's already well more than $350 into this search. So uh, regardless if this goes for the private investigator or not, on behalf of myself and my amazing supporters through PayPal and Patreon, I'm going to make a donation to this just as soon as I'm done filming here today. So Brain Scratchers, this is where I turn it over to you. Um, very strange case. I think the three main possibilities we're looking at, uh, Brittany herself even said that she thought there was a fairly strong possibility that maybe he did decide to end things and that he went out there to do it. I don't know if she still feels that way. Uh, I saw some comments from her that were kind of early on where that was the strongest of the possibilities. For me, the stuff, the questions that are raised about how the house was found, that's taking precedence over that for me. It, it's just, there. There's t it's too strange for the safe to be found, not just open, but in that manner where it looks like someone had been working for a prolonged period of time to get into it. And I just, I can't believe it would have been him with his experience, his knowledge. If I'm, I'm going to say it one more time, if he had opened that safe once in his life and saw how that locking mechanism worked, there is no way that he thought any amount of prying, especially in that area. It just, it's not smart. It's, it's, it, there's no, I don't believe it. I don't believe that he did that. And if you don't believe that he did that, 
that points this case in a whole different direction. Because now you've got someone that has access to his home long enough to try to do something like that, long enough to actually figure out how to get it open, and long enough to clean it out. And not just clean it out, take every other gun that you can find. And you heard it from the investigator. They looked in every crawl space, every nook, every cranny. And his family had actually commented, you should have seen this guy. I went over to his house. He was pulling guns out of everywhere. And now every single gun is missing. This, this place has been cleaned out. And if this place has been cleaned out, and if he didn't do it, there's a criminal aspect to this case and they haven't found the linkage to it yet. And I can't, I can't unstick myself from that. I'm just, I'm really, really focused on that after looking at all the information that's been presented here. Um, outside of that, is there something else that could be going on here? I don't know. I want you guys to tell me about that in the comments down below. And Brittany, thank you so much for reaching out. Uh, thank you for trusting me to look into this, to help you raise exposure to this. I hope that we get some tips called in on this. Um, someone out there, if someone all of a sudden did clean out this house, took 35 weapons, all these other materials from the safe, there's other people out there that are buying it. There's people out there that are talking about what a great deal they got. There's a chain of communication that would be going on around those items. And we need someone smart enough to see this video or to listen to the Vanish podcast and say, you know what? I remember a little something about a friend of mine. And around the time this guy went missing, yeah, he talked about that he had come into some stuff. Oh, and by the way, he lives in this area. Um, the pieces, I believe, are out there. We need the right person that has a big enough heart to put those pieces together and to pick up the phone. If that happens to be you, we've got all the contact information that you need in the description box below. So please help Brittany find the answer of what happened to her father. Thank you guys so much. Uh, before I end today's video, I want to thank several new patrons, starting with Shoban Householder, Damon Reed, and Christina Penn. Also, Shoban increased her pledge after joining. Thank you very much. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for PayPal, sign up for Patreon, or buy merchandise. All of it helps keep me here trying to help these families in these very tough situations and doing it always with limited commercials, and in some cases, like probably today's video, no commercials at all. I can't do it without your guys' help, so please visit lordandarts.com, and thank you to everyone that has. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Stay healthy. I'll be back on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch right here on the Lord and Arts channel. 